This is Monaco, playground for the rich. It may be best known for its Grand Prix motor race and its Monte Carlo casino. But what makes Monaco really special is the fact that it has no income tax. Today, we'll be taking a detailed look at income tax. We'll see how it can motivate wealthy people to move to a country like Monaco, even if they truly care about the poor. And later, we'll see how the United States federal income tax could inspire people to move to New Hampshire and push for independence. Over the last century, income tax has become increasingly popular worldwide. Governments love it because it brings in lots of revenue. And voters generally favor it too, not just in the United States, but in most countries. You might say that human societies have a proclivity for taxing income. Of course, not everyone's a fan. In 1954, Frank Chodorov wrote a book called The Income Tax, Root of All Evil, in which he explains how this tax fundamentally changes the nature of government. You can read this book at no charge on the Foundation for Economic Education website. But for today, I'll be focusing on practical considerations. I'll demonstrate four things about income tax that are objectively true. One, in most countries, it benefits the majority. Two, some countries get along just fine without it. Three, it gives some people a big reason to leave the country, even if they truly want to help those in need. And four, it gives lots of people some reason to leave the country. Point one. In most countries, an income tax benefits the majority. By that, I mean fully informed voters acting rationally in their own best interest will tend to choose an income tax. The reason is simple. Low income people pay less under an income tax than they would under some other tax, raising the same amount of total revenue. And low income people make up the majority in most countries. This is why almost every country has an income tax. And even if it were somehow repealed, there would likely be enormous political pressure to bring it back. Point two, some countries get along just fine without an income tax. Here are two examples. However, before I continue, I need to cover a technicality. Monaco does have a business income tax, and both countries have a social security tax, but these aren't what most people think of as being an income tax. So for the rest of this presentation, when I say income tax, please understand that I'm referring to a tax on personal income with the exclusions listed here. Among countries with no income tax, the United Arab Emirates is distinguished by its large population, over 9 million in 2018. Its most populous city is Dubai, with over 3 million residents. The Principality of Monaco is truly a remarkable country. About 30% of its residents are millionaires. Monaco actually has more workers than it does residents, with thousands of people commuting in from France and Italy. Monaco has open borders with France, which effectively means it has open borders with the entire Schengen area. If you live in Monaco, you can visit most of Europe without having to go through customs. So what makes these countries different? How do they avoid the usual proclivity for taxing income? One common factor seems to be high exports per capita. The United Arab Emirates exports a lot of oil and gas, and tourism is a major part of the economy in just about every country with no income tax. Now, you might not think of tourism as an export, but in the economic sense, it is. Visiting tourists are paying money into the local economy. You might say these countries are exporting vacation memories. Once a country decides not to tax income, it tends to stay that way because the absence of an income tax attracts immigrants with high income. That tends to boost the median income and helps counter any lingering political pressure to establish an income tax. Point three, an income tax gives some people a big reason to leave the country, even if they truly want to help those in need. There's a fair amount of confusion and denial on this point, so I'm going to walk you through a detailed example. Imagine a wealthy investor named Alice. 
She's an expert at recognizing undervalued assets. She buys them, often on margin, and later sells them when their value has recovered. Those assets could be stocks, real estate, precious metals, fine art, or anything else whose value changes over time. Let's say Alice has $40 million of capital. Through savvy investments, she makes an average annual return of over 14%, giving her an income of just under $6 million a year. Most of her investment assets are held for one year or less. But Alice is also a humble person. She lives in a modest home. She drives a modest car. You wouldn't know just by looking at her that she's a wealthy investor. Let's say her household expenses come to about $100,000 a year. She lives well, but not extravagantly. What does she do with the rest of her annual income? Still nearly $6 million. She wants to give it all away because she has a heart of gold. She donates to organizations in her local community, helping those in need, as well as international charities like Habitat for Humanity, Rise Against Hunger, and Doctors Without Borders. But Alice can't give it all away because some of it has to go to taxes. Let's look at her tax situation. To keep it simple, we'll only look at her federal income tax. Let's say her investment income is her only income and all of that is short-term capital gains. She can deduct 60% for her charitable contributions. The rest is taxable, almost all at the 37% rate. She also has to pay the net investment income tax of 3.8%. Her total tax each year comes to $1,020,000. What would her taxes be if she moved to Monaco? There's no income tax and no property tax either. She'd only have to pay the value added tax of 20% on her household expenses. That comes to $20,000 a year. So here in the United States, she's paying a million dollars a year more in taxes than she'd have to pay in Monaco. That's 51 times as much. Before I continue, I need to cover another technicality. The United States taxes its citizens regardless of where they live. In fact, it's the only major country that does that. So in order for Alice to get the tax benefit, she'll need to renounce her US citizenship. Now, it takes 10 years to become a citizen of Monaco. Suppose she doesn't want to wait that long to start saving money. Most likely, she'd become a citizen of Singapore instead and then relocate to Monaco. There are other options, but the Singapore option provides a highly respected passport with a much shorter waiting period of just two years. All of the steps listed here are perfectly legal and they're not very difficult for someone with Alice's financial resources. One potential concern is something called the Reed Amendment that I'll discuss later. Anyway, for the rest of this presentation, when I say move to Monaco, please treat that as an abbreviation for the steps listed here. Now, imagine Alice is speaking to you directly and she says, Hey, I'm thinking about moving to Monaco so I can redirect this million dollars a year toward my favorite charities. But suppose I don't. Suppose I stay here in the United States and continue to pay this million dollars a year in the form of taxes. What am I getting for all that money? Sell it to me. How might you respond to Alice? Would you talk about freedom? In school, we're taught that the United States is a free country, land of liberty. But the Constitution of Monaco lists a lot of the same freedoms as the United States Bill of Rights, including freedom of religion, expression, and peaceful assembly. Let's get specific. Can you give a concrete example of something you're free to do in the United States that Alice wouldn't be free to do in Monaco? Actually, there are a couple of things. Monaco currently doesn't allow same-sex marriage. There is a law that went into effect this past June to recognize cohabitation agreements, but same-sex couples still can't adopt children. Also, marijuana is currently illegal there. If either of these are issues for Alice, she might consider moving to Bermuda instead of Monaco. How good a job is Monaco doing with the most basic function of government, preventing crime? Actually, Monaco is one of the safest places in the world. The rates of homicide, burglary, 
and rape are all much lower in Monaco than they are in the United States. At this point, you might be inclined to admit that in the United States, Alice is not getting anywhere near 51 times as much value from the government as she would in Monaco. You might concede that when she pays her taxes, the money is mostly not coming back in the form of tangible benefits to her. Instead, it's mostly going to other people. But then you remember that she's a generous person, so you might say, Hey Alice, I'm sure you know the government does a lot to help the poor with programs like temporary assistance for needy families, uh, the supplemental nutrition assistance program, and even earned income tax credit. Can't you think of your own taxes as a convenient way to help those less fortunate? Isn't that something you want to do anyway? And Alice would reply, I certainly do want to help those in need, but the government isn't adding any value to the charitable giving process. In fact, there are three solid reasons I'd rather donate that money to suitable charities. Efficiency, priority, and acknowledgement. Suppose Alice stays in the United States and pays that million dollars a year in the form of taxes, thinking of the government as a charity. What percentage of that money will actually go to help those in need? In the federal budget historical tables, Section 11 covers payments for individuals. In 2018, the on-budget portion was 59% of the total. The other 41% went to other things like the military and paying interest on the national debt. Of course, Alice has no way of verifying how much of payments for individuals actually helps people in need. But even if all of it does, that's only 59%. In contrast, Habitat for Humanity puts 78% of their budget towards their program of helping to build homes for people. Alice's other charities have even higher program expense percentages. Now, let's talk about priority. If Alice stays in the United States, even the 59% of her taxes that become payments for individuals are almost all paid to Americans. But Alice may want to make a substantial contribution in those areas of the world where the need is greatest, like India and Bangladesh, where there's a lot of poverty. Of course, she'll also want to focus on her local community, but that has nothing to do with national boundaries. For example, if she lives in San Diego, it would be counterintuitive to say that Boston is a part of her community, but Tijuana is not. The biggest reason Alice would rather donate to charities is acknowledgement. Even if we say that poor people in the United States are higher priority than those in India, Bangladesh, or Mexico, still those receiving assistance are led to believe that the money came from the government. If they think anyone at all, they might think their favorite politician, someone like Bernie Sanders. It won't even occur to them to think taxpayers like Alice who could have moved to Monaco, but chose not to. I want to emphasize that these comments about efficiency, priority, and acknowledgement shouldn't be construed to suggest that the government trim its military budget or increase aid to countries with extreme poverty or start sending thank you notes to taxpayers. That's not the point. The point is that it doesn't make sense to think of the government as a charity. Instead, it makes sense for taxpayers to save money using whatever legal means are available, like deducting home mortgage interest, or in Alice's case, moving to Monaco. You might ask, if high income people can save so much money by moving to a country like Monaco, then why do hardly any of them actually do so? It's a fair question. According to the IRS, for tax year 2017, there were just over 50,000 people with adjusted gross income of $5 million or more. That puts Alice in the top 0.03% by income, which may seem tiny, but this group paid over 13% of all federal income tax collected for that year. About 2,000 people renounced their U.S. citizenship in 2019, and over 5,000 did so in 2016. We don't know how many of them belong to this ultra-high income group, but even if all of them do, that still leaves a lot of folks who you might think would have an incentive to renounce their citizenship. 
So why don't they? We can only speculate, but two possibilities come to mind. The first is fear of being labeled unpatriotic. One of the high-profile renunciations from 2011 was Eduardo Saverin, co-founder of Facebook. By renouncing his citizenship, he may have saved tens of millions of dollars in capital gains taxes, though he says he wasn't motivated by taxes. Senator Chuck Schumer described his action as unpatriotic. Senator Orrin Hatch said, It always bothers me when somebody renounces his citizenship in the greatest country on earth just to save money, save taxes. Now, Alice may feel that a truly great country wouldn't disparage someone who followed the law. But if a lot of her friends agree with Chuck Schumer and Orrin Hatch, then she may be reluctant to renounce her own citizenship. The other obvious deterrent to leaving the country for lower taxes is desire to stay near friends and family, which is especially important in the United States because of the Reid Amendment that I mentioned earlier. This 1996 amendment to an immigration bill specifies that any former citizen who is determined by the Attorney General to have renounced their citizenship for the purpose of avoiding taxation is not allowed to re-enter the country. The amendment was named after then-Representative Jack Reed. It has almost never been enforced. In 2015, the Department of Homeland Security reported that over the previous 13 years, only two people had been denied entry based on the Reid Amendment. Now, Singapore is a part of the Visa Waiver Program, meaning that citizens of Singapore are normally allowed to visit the United States for up to 90 days without a visa. So if the government were to enforce the Reid Amendment in Alice's case, they would be treating her differently from other Singapore citizens, not letting her visit friends and family simply because she decided to save money legally. The fear that they might do this could dissuade Alice from renouncing her citizenship. I've portrayed Alice as quite altruistic, perhaps uncommonly so. But even if she were more selfish, she'd still have a big reason to move to Monaco. To see this, imagine that Alice has a friend, Bob, who's also an investor with similar income. Bob doesn't care at all about the poor. He likes to spend his money on fast cars. His taxes in the United States are over $2 million a year because he doesn't get any deduction for charitable contributions. In Monaco, even paying the value-added tax on all of his cars, he would still pay less than a million dollars a year. So Bob would actually save even more money than Alice by moving to Monaco. Keep in mind that Alice's situation is not unique to the United States. If she were living in Canada, or Germany, or Sweden, or just about any country with any income tax, she would have a very similar strong motivation to move to a country like Monaco. Her dilemma is inherent in the very nature of income tax. Point four, an income tax gives lots of people some reason to leave the country. To see this, let's look at a case that comes up a lot more often than Alice's. Imagine a freelance software developer named Kathy. She works from home as an independent contractor, developing web applications for clients who could be anywhere in the world. She might use one or more of these freelancing sites to find clients. Her gross income is $83,000 a year. On her tax return, she reports an expense for the business use of her home, and she takes the qualified business income deduction. Her total federal income tax each year comes to just over $18,000. According to the IRS, for tax year 2017, there were over 40 million people with adjusted gross income of $75,000 or more. So Kathy is in the top 27% by income. This group paid over 88% of all the federal income tax collected for that year. During the recent pandemic, a lot of folks discovered that they could work effectively from home. And in fact, they could probably work from any place in the world that has good internet access. Moving to Monaco is not a realistic option for Kathy. To apply for residence, she'd normally have to deposit over $500,000 in a Monaco bank. 
Even if she could get around that somehow, she probably couldn't afford an apartment there with enough space for living and working. But in the United Arab Emirates, Kathy could get a freelance permit. The country has several areas known as free zones that issue such permits. For example, Dubai Internet City offers a permit described at gofreelance.ae that would allow Kathy to work in Dubai. She'd need to demonstrate her earning potential from freelancing. If she has existing clients that keep her fairly busy and don't mind her working from Dubai, so much the better. There's no income tax in the United Arab Emirates, but Kathy would have to pay the value-added tax of 5% on her household expenses. There are also annual costs associated with the freelance permit. How much she'd really save depends on her cost of living in the United States. In this example, the rent on her apartment is higher in Dubai, but her health insurance is lower because she's allowed to purchase just the catastrophic coverage she needs. She ends up saving about $10,000 a year. Because Kathy is American, she has one more hurdle to overcome. She'll need to become a citizen of some other country so she can renounce her U.S. citizenship to get the tax benefit as an independent contractor. It turns out that becoming a naturalized citizen of the United Arab Emirates is just about impossible, even after 30 years. So she'll need to look elsewhere. If Kathy has grandparents from Italy, she may be able to obtain Italian citizenship quickly. Otherwise, Portugal allows freelancing with its D7 visa, and she can become a citizen there after five years. Alternatively, if she can find full-time employment in Singapore, she can become a citizen there after two years. Kathy will need to consider that the United Arab Emirates offers significantly less social freedom than in the United States. Perhaps most strikingly, homosexuality is forbidden there. So not just gay marriage, but being gay at all is illegal. For what it's worth, Romeo's Gay Happiness Index ranked the country 85th out of 127, just slightly better than Russia. Despite its shortage of liberty, Dubai shows one important thing. It's economically feasible for someone like Kathy to save $10,000 a year in taxes. Let's review what we've said about income tax. On the one hand, in most countries, it benefits the majority. On the other hand, people with above average income can generally save money by moving to a country with no income tax. For someone like Alice, the savings are enormous, but even at Kathy's income level, the savings are enough to be noticeable. There's actually a name for just this type of situation, tyranny of the majority. This refers to the majority using the democratic process to benefit themselves at the expense of a minority. John Adams wrote about tyranny of the majority in 1788, saying that the newly drafted constitution should help protect against it. Unfortunately, there's no easy defense against this fundamental flaw in the democratic process. In 1909, the 16th Amendment was proposed allowing a federal income tax. And by 1913, 42 states had voted to ratify it. And really, it's hard to blame people when they vote for something that benefits them. So as much as Alice and Kathy may resent being overtaxed, their only practical remedy is to leave the country. But New Hampshire may offer a novel way for them to say goodbye because of the Free State Project, which is building a community of folks who would make natural allies for people like Kathy. Let's take a little break from the income tax discussion to learn about this organization. The Free State Project is a movement to bring libertarians to New Hampshire, people who want small government. Specifically, they want a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of an individual's rights to life, liberty, and property. For example, Libertarians believe it's not the proper role of government to help those who don't have enough food and other essentials. Instead, that's the proper role of voluntary charity. They also believe it's not the proper role of government to protect people from themselves. If government like that strikes you as too small, you're not alone. 
Most people want big government, and that includes many Republicans, despite what they say. It's the libertarians who truly want small government. They're quite passionate about it, but they're in the minority. The Free State Project got started in 2001, when Jason Sorens wrote an essay, back when he was a graduate student at Yale. He mentioned that partisan politics wasn't working for libertarians, because they never win any elections. But he had an idea. He suggested that if a bunch of libertarians were to move to one low population state, then maybe within that state, their voice would be heard. By 2003, 5,000 people had signed up. At that point, they held a vote to decide which state to move to, and they ended up choosing New Hampshire. It was a natural choice, because New Hampshire was already leaning libertarian. Today, the Free State Project continues to recruit more participants, and they've already built a community of libertarians in New Hampshire that's unlike anything you'll find in any other state. The generally accepted definition of a libertarian is someone who takes the non-aggression principle as a moral guide. There are a number of different formulations of it. This one is by John Stuart Mill. The only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So basically, it's wrong to use force against a person except to defend against that person's aggression. Libertarians are neither left nor right. In fact, they consider the left-right spectrum overly simplistic. They share some common ground with each of the major parties. They generally agree with Democrats on marijuana, privacy, and police accountability. They generally agree with Republicans on reducing taxes, welfare programs, and business regulations. If you visit theadvocates.org, you can see a two-dimensional chart with the traditional left and right toward the sides and libertarians near the top. Now, I'd like to offer you some libertarian food for thought. Here are some moral questions related to helping those in need. First, is it morally wrong for Alice to move to Monaco? Is it morally wrong for Bob to move to Monaco? How about if Bob just moves from California to New Hampshire to save money on state taxes? If your answer is different there, then why? What's the moral distinction between moving to another state and moving to another country? Now, imagine a man named Pierre who was born in Monaco and has lived there all his life. Does Pierre have a moral obligation to help those in need? If so, how much does he owe? And should he focus on nearby countries like France, Italy, and Switzerland? Or should he target countries like India that have extreme poverty? What's the priority? Then, consider the same questions for Alice and Bob after they move to Monaco. The libertarian view is that there is nothing morally wrong with any of those moves. And it's up to Pierre, Alice, and Bob to decide according to their own conscience how much to donate and to whom. Morality doesn't dictate any particular minimum or any particular priority. Okay, now suppose we're chatting with Bob and he says, How much would you suggest that I donate? I promise that if you make a reasonable suggestion, I'll follow it. How should we respond to Bob? For the next few minutes, let's try to take his question fairly seriously. Along the way, we're going to introduce a new concept, charity demand rate, with two variants, global and local. We want to make a suggestion that anyone in the world could follow. That's why we're going to suggest a percentage of discretionary income, rather than gross income. After all, someone living paycheck to paycheck has no discretionary income so they really shouldn't be donating anything. Our goal is to ensure that everyone in the world can meet their basic needs, including food, clothing, shelter, and healthcare. Keep in mind, a lot of these needs are currently met through welfare programs in various countries. We want to suggest that Bob donate his share of what it would cost to meet these needs if welfare programs didn't exist. So let's imagine the whole world has gone libertarian and all welfare programs have been eliminated. 
Then suppose each person who has discretionary income donates a certain percentage of it. What would that percentage have to be to raise enough money to achieve our goal? Let's give that percentage a name. We're going to call it the global charity demand rate. For example, suppose it turns out we need $4 trillion a year to ensure that everyone in the world can meet their basic needs. And suppose the total worldwide discretionary income is $10 trillion a year. Then the global charity demand rate is 40%. In other words, if each person donates 40% of their discretionary income, we can achieve our goal with no need for welfare programs. Then we could go back to Bob and say, Hey Bob, we have a suggestion. We'd like to suggest that you donate 40% of your discretionary income to help people who are unable to meet their basic needs wherever you may encounter them in the world. And we'd like to encourage all of your friends to do the same. Of course, 40% was just an example. And this brings us to the first problem with our approach. We don't know what the global charity demand rate really is. We don't even have a rough idea. So there's no practical way for Bob to follow our suggestion. Each country also has a local charity demand rate. This is a similar percentage of discretionary income, but limited to just that one country. As an example, let's estimate the local charity demand rate in the United States for 2018. Total welfare was almost a trillion dollars. If welfare programs were eliminated, presumably people would have to donate that money, in addition to the 400 billion or so that they actually did donate. Estimating discretionary expenses is a bit subjective, but for now, let's go with the shaded categories. Then we add personal saving to get total discretionary income. We're also going to add total welfare to discretionary income because we're assuming we've gotten rid of welfare programs. So the local charity demand rate works out to about 30%. Assuming this number is accurate, this means if each person in the United States donated 30% of their discretionary income, they would raise enough money to meet everyone's basic needs throughout the country without welfare programs. The local charity demand rate varies a lot from one country to another. Monaco, for instance, has hardly any poverty at all, and that's exactly why we're suggesting that Bob donate based on the global charity demand rate rather than the tiny local charity demand rate in Monaco. Unfortunately, much more common are countries like Haiti, Laos, Suriname, Uganda, Honduras, Nepal, Guyana, and Madagascar, where many people live in extreme poverty. The local charity demand rate in any of these countries may exceed 100%, meaning the country would need outside help to see that everyone had food and other necessities. Bottom line, meeting everyone's basic needs may be harder than you think. And that brings us to the second problem with our suggestion for Bob. What if it turns out the global charity demand rate is more than 100%? Let's think through what that would mean. It would be saying that even if each person donated their entire discretionary income, the money raised wouldn't be enough to meet everyone's basic needs worldwide. Obviously, Bob can't donate more than 100% of his discretionary income. So, people like Alice and Bob would need to make some tough decisions about priority in their charitable giving. Keep in mind that welfare programs wouldn't solve this problem, because taxes for those programs still ultimately need to come out of discretionary income. And if the global charity demand rate is more than 100%, that means there isn't enough discretionary income. Now, let's get back to people like Kathy, who prefer no income tax. Right now, they're spread out across the country, always in the minority, wherever they are. What if a whole lot of them moved to New Hampshire and pushed for independence? It's a long shot, but let's think through how it might happen. Earlier, we saw that over 40 million people have adjusted gross income of $75,000 or more. Let's call that group Club 75. A recent report by FlexJobs indicated that 3.4% of workers in the United States do their work remotely. So within Club 75, we can expect that about 1.4 million people work remotely. Let's call that group Remote Club 75. 
These are the people like Kathy. They'd be better off without income tax, and they're in a position to do something about it because they can easily move. They could move to Dubai, but suppose over the next 10 years, 500,000 of them move to New Hampshire. A migration like that would be quite extraordinary. The population of New Hampshire would increase by 37%. Then again, Arizona's population grew at about that rate for four decades in a row, from the 60s to the 90s. So for the next few minutes, let's indulge in a little dreaming and see where it takes us. What would draw that many remote Club 75 folks to New Hampshire? Perhaps just the desire to hang out with libertarians who understand that income tax is tyranny of the majority. But they also might see an outside chance to be a part of something historic. I want to emphasize that the Free State Project is neutral on the subject of New Hampshire independence. But many participants are open to the idea. And another organization, the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence, is promoting the benefits. We can expect that almost 200,000 Club 75 people already live in New Hampshire. They may or may not work remotely, but it doesn't matter since they don't need to move. If this group plus the 500,000 people moving into the state could convince a little over 100,000 more people, they would constitute a majority of voters. This would be a watershed moment. For the first time ever, there would be a majority of voters in one state wanting out of the federal income tax. They might then push for independence. Let's try to envision how they might do that. Keep in mind that what follows is pure speculation. This is just one of many ways things might play out. With that said, imagine 10 years from now, you turn on the news and you hear this. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of the Alliance for New Hampshire Independence. We want New Hampshire to withdraw from the United States and become an independent country. We're looking to accomplish this peacefully, just as Slovakia peacefully withdrew from Czechoslovakia and became an independent country in 1993. We want independence primarily so that we can be free of federal income tax. Some of us will save more than others, but the dollar amount isn't really the point. For us, this is a moral issue. Income tax is a textbook example of tyranny of the majority, where the majority benefits at the expense of a minority. But if that's too hard to understand, you can go with a simpler explanation, that many of us just want to save $10,000 a year. We plan to follow the model of existing countries with no income tax, like Monaco and the United Arab Emirates, but we'll also make several improvements the most important of which is better naturalization. New Hampshire will offer a realistic path to citizenship in a timely manner for an immigrant with no criminal history, even if they're not wealthy. Neither Monaco nor the United Arab Emirates offer this. We're going to lobby for independence based on the right of self-determination as described in Article 55 of the United Nations Charter. But we're fully aware that as a practical matter, we have no unilateral right to independence. We'll need to negotiate with the federal government. We hope to work out a treaty similar to the treaty between Monaco and France. We know this is going to be challenging. But right now, let's focus on you, the current residents of New Hampshire who didn't ask for any of this. We want to do everything we can to make this transition beneficial for you too. We believe the new country will be an attractive place to live for the same reasons people enjoy living in Monaco, but it'll no longer be a part of the United States. And if that makes you uncomfortable, we understand. Maybe you're feeling patriotic, or maybe you're uneasy about living outside your home country. Whatever the reason, we want to see if we can negotiate to have you relocate at our expense to Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, or perhaps some other state. That way, you can continue living in the country you love 
and we can finally have the freedom from income tax that we prefer. Of course you're welcome to stay in New Hampshire and give the new country a try. You can retain your U.S. citizenship, and as long as you do so, you'll remain eligible for Social Security benefits. As for Medicare, one of the things we want to negotiate as part of our treaty is that New Hampshire healthcare providers can accept Medicare for U.S. citizens. If we can't negotiate this, you'll need to visit a provider in Maine, Vermont, or Massachusetts to make use of Medicare. We'd love to have open borders with the United States, just as Monaco has open borders with France, but it's not a deal breaker for us. The federal government may want to impose border controls, perhaps to enforce the Reid Amendment. Interstate 95 would most likely remain federal property so that drivers can travel easily between Maine and Massachusetts. Border controls would be set up at the on and off ramps within New Hampshire. New immigrants to New Hampshire will be permanently ineligible for welfare. Current residents will be grandfathered into existing welfare programs. But we want to move the country gradually in a libertarian direction. And one obvious way to do this is to deny welfare to new immigrants. Now, let's be clear about what this means. New immigrants will need to rely on voluntary charity if for any reason they become unable to earn a living. Hopefully their neighbors will be generous, but the risk is always there that voluntary charity won't be enough. The interview process will make sure immigrants clearly understand this and accept the risk. Of course, this is the same risk that 19th century American pioneers faced. And if mankind ventures out into space, the first colonists of other planets will face this same risk. All of us pushing for independence accept it, and we're sure that many people in countries like Bangladesh would accept this risk in a heartbeat if they could live in New Hampshire. So how exactly can we negotiate with the federal government for independence? What's in it for them? One small benefit is that nearly a million people will be renouncing citizenship. And with the fee of over $2,000 for each one, that comes to about $2 billion of revenue for them. But ultimately, we need to convince them that it's the right thing to do, given that they no longer have the consent of the governed in New Hampshire. It's the proper remedy for tyranny of the majority. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and found it thought-provoking. Feel free to like, share, and comment.